So we start now. Uh, we have one hour for the lecture, and then uh, we have time for the discussion. OK. OK. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Um, I see we're wired up here. <clears throat> OK. Uh, today, my uh, focus is going to be on counterfactual conditionals and the project of analyzing them uh, by giving a kind of metaphysical reduction. And my, uh, my general line that I'm going to try to defend is that this is a uh, mistake. Uh, it's not possible to give uh, a reductive analysis. And furthermore, a reductive analysis is not well motivated. Um, uh, but in doing that, I want to sort of bring out exactly what, is, what are the commitments um, of a reductive uh, analysis. And there are different kinds and different motivations that one might have. And I'm going to argue that the traditional motivation, uh, the traditional empiricist motivation uh, for a reduct of some kind of reduction, reductive explanation of na not only of counterfactuals, but of the family of concepts involving natural necessity, that the traditional um, empiricist motivation for this project is radically different from Lewis's motivation, uh, but, um, but he adopts some of the same um, uh, sort of ways of thinking um, uh, about it. OK, so my plan is first I'm going to start by looking back to a version from the late uh, logical empiricist era uh, by Nelson Good, famous, the classic paper by Nelson Goodman, and at exactly how he understands the project of giving a reductive analysis of counterfactuals and why he regarded it as a failure. And we'll look next time at what the alternative is if once you regard it as a failure, both what Goodman thought the, um, uh, the alternative strategy was and what I think uh, more generally the way we should think about um, the alternative way of explaining um, these family of, this family of concepts of natural necessity. So I'm going to start by looking at Goodman. Then second, I want to make some general remarks about the strategy of metaphysical analysis. And of course, the traditional empiricists did not think of their analysis as metaphysical. Uh, but often, later versions of the same kind of theory talk less about um, reductive definition, as if it were kind of a semantic notion, and more about a notion of supervenience. Uh, that is, that all there is in the world is um, given by some unproblematic description at a certain level, and all the rest is supervenient on that. That is, if you were to fix all of the facts of the unproblematic kind identified, then you will have fixed all the facts, that everything that there is a fact of the matter about. So the later sort of version of the kind of reductive strategy is metaphysical in the sense that it's a theory about what, what there is a fact of the matter about. That is, what, are the, uh, what are the facts in the world that, um, that we, uh, or the facts about the world, uh, that distinguish between um, real <coughs> possibilities. Okay, so that's the second thing is general remarks about them, including other kinds of uh, reductive uh, projects, uh, but the general idea of a metaphysical uh, reduction. Then third, I want to look at Lewis's more specific um, reductive project and at his concept of Humean supervenience. So Lewis has a view that all, everything there is a fact of the matter about is reducible to a certain uh, kind of description or characterization of the world and um, the project then is to reduce things to that. Anything uh, that isn't, uh, is apparently of a different kind 
to explain how it really isn't of a different kind. So a, a reductive uh, strategy generally will be kind of hierarchical and sort of goes with contemporary ways of thinking about metaphysics in a kind of hierarchical way when makes uh, a lot of uh, deal about fundamentality and, and there, is, there is a fundamental level of description of the world and um, there are, if there are other things they are somehow more derivative or less fundamental so uh, and the, the explanation or defense of a supervenience thesis of this metaphysical kind may involve um, a further hierarchy that as you say first we're going to reduce um, um, a certain basic notion to some even more basic notion and then we're going to go and uh, reduce some further thing to, to the first two and so on. So in particular Lewis's project takes a very explicit hierarchical form, an order of, uh, of analysis specified so that one avoids, uh, one takes pains to avoid circularity. Uh, okay, so that's the uh, the third uh, thing and um, the main sort of part of the project that Lewis project that we'll focus on is the explanation of the uh, I mean, one has a semantic analysis an abstract semantic analysis of counterfactuals in terms of what Lewis thought of as a similarity ordering uh, comparative similarity ordering between possible worlds and one can characterize the um, similarity relation, uh, the structure of it abstractly, but that puts very few constraints on the substantive uh, nature of the uh, explanation, of, of the uh, nature of the relation. So the question is, how should one explain in terms that are unproblematic from the point of view of the supervenient space uh, what the order of similarity uh, is. And we'll see when we get there, there's a sp more specific problem that Lewis is concerned about, uh, which we also should be um, concerned about, concerning uh, the relationship between temporal order and the order of, of uh, um, causal and counterfactual dependence. Um, okay, so um, we'll look at both the um, the general idea of uh, Lewis's um, uh, account and at, uh, at uh, his criteria of similarity that he proposes. And finally, um, at the end, um, I want to make some general remarks about the supervenient space um, and at the, particularly the contrasting motivations. I'm going to spend some time looking at some traditional empiricist ways of, of defending the need for human reduction, reduction to a human base, and contrast those with, uh, with Lewis's very different ways of thinking about it. Um, okay, so start again, as I say, with Goodman's um, uh, project. Um, so the general form, this is again the first section of, of the handout, the general form of the analysis um, is this, a conditional, and I'll use Lewis's notation, which is a box arrow um, conductive for the, con the counterfactual conditional. A conditional A um, box arrow C, or if A then C, if A were the case, then C would be the case, is true if and only if, according to Goodman's uh, general form of the kind of analysis he's looking at, if and only if um, you can join A, the antecedent of the conditional, with a suitable set of true propositions, gamma, and if that, uh, that set of sentences entails C, then um, uh, then the counterfactual is true. If it fails to entail C, then the counterfactual is false. Um, so uh, it's a constraint, so the, the way Goodman conceived of the project, the problem is to characterize 
the set gamma. This is not quite the way Goodman puts it, but it's sort of streamlining it into a very abstract um, form. Um, now, gamma has got to be a set of true sentences, but it, if it were the set of all true sentences, it would include not A, because we're assuming we're analyzing counterfactual conditionals where the antecedent is false. So um, you would get an immediate reduction of your analysis to the material conditional, which, as Goodman and everybody else will uh, agree, is unsuitable obviously for counterfactual. So the uh, counterfactual is a proposition in the normal case, not all subjunctive conditionals have this feature, but uh, the, stand, the sort of paradigm counterfactuals are conditionals uh, for which it is presupposed that they taken for granted uh, that the antecedent is false. So um, it would follow from what you're taking for granted, the conditional, uh, no matter what the consequent, if, uh, if the conditional were material. So it's agreed that counterfactuals, I mean, there's some defense of indicative conditionals analysis as material conditionals, but nobody thinks that counterfactuals um, are, if, if you can make sense of them at all, are material um, conditionals. So the problem is to characterize the set uh, gamma, or which is really index this to the antecedent because the relevant set of conditions will be uh, relevant to a particular uh, antecedent. Um, okay, so um, Goodman assumed that the project of explaining gamma, or gamma sub A, would have a set of, of uh, conditions which uh, are facts that you can use uh, to derive uh, uh, the consequent, uh, is uh, something that has two parts, uh, a set L of laws of nature, uh, and a set of what he called relevant conditions, which are factual conditions, particular fa matters of particular detail. Uh, which are suitable to assume uh, in assessing a counterfactual. So the problem is to characterize those two things. Now, the problem of analyzing, or the problem of laws of nature was a familiar problem in the positivist tradition of trying to explain theoretical language in terms of the observation language. Um, the problem is uh, recognized and thought of in these terms. It was to say, look, if we had counterfactuals, we can explain the difference between laws of nature and mere accidental generalizations. So we use, for example, somebody used uh, all the uh, dimes, all the coins in my pocket are dimes, um, is a, um, uh, is a, uh, an accidental generalization it, nobody thinks that this is some deep truth about uh, my pocket or dimes. Um, all the people sitting on that bench speak Swedish. Um, uh, this might be true, and it's a universal generalization because it's everybody sitting on that bench. Um, uh, but um, uh, obviously not a law. So what's the difference between laws and accidental generalizations? Uh, laws, uh, uh, one of the ways of trying to explain it would say laws support counterfactuals. Um, so uh, even if uh, all the dimes, all the coins in my pockets are dimes, if I put um, um, some uh, euros in there as well, then it would no longer be true. Um, so if there were uh, euros in my pocket, um, it would be false that all the coins are. So that generalization doesn't survive counterfactual um, uh, judgments, whereas the law of nature is supposed to be one that's not only true but would be true under various counterfactual, would remain true under various counterfactual <laughs> conditions. But then we say, but we want to use laws to analyze counterfactuals, so it's the danger of circularity. So um, the, 
people in the Goodman, uh, Goodman tradition and the positivist tradition generally insisted that we need to give some explanation of laws of nature. So that was part of the problem to say what's, what is a law of nature. It's a universal generalization, but not just any old universal generalization. The second part of the problem is what, uh, as I say, what Goodman called the, the problem of uh, relevant uh, conditions. So uh, I use sort of standard kinds of examples that Goodman used. Um, um, uh, the coin, or rather the, the match, uh, wasn't struck and it didn't light. Would it have lit if it had struck? You say, well, it's a fact that it didn't light. Um, that's uh, a fact that you can't um, obviously uh, continue to assume as being something that would still be true even if the match were struck. Um, there was a sufficient oxygen in the room, uh, as a matter of fact, um, and we can assume that if the match had been struck, there still would have been um, 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 oxygen enough. The match was not put in water before it was struck. Uh, we can assume that in the world, um, as it would be if the, uh, the match were struck, um, there still, it still would be true that it wasn't put in water. Why do uh, you assume these things can be uh, maintained, these can't? So Goodman's project was to try to explain uh, by using certain very specifically limited resources um, what, the, uh, what the rules were for ruling in and ruling out various facts, uh, uh, particular facts, as well as uh, laws uh, of, of nature. So one can see this as a single problem uh, the problem of specifying the whole set gamma, including the laws and the relevant um, conditions. What are the constraints? And again, the constraints are governed by the motivation for finding an analysis. It's an empiricist, they're empiricist constraints. So uh, we're allowed to use, we're allowed to uh, rule in and out various properties in virtue of their truth value, that's given, that's to start with, they've got to be true. But second, uh, we can use logical relations between the antecedent, the consequent, or any combination of the antecedent and the consequent, and, um, um, and the candidate. So if he has, is some fact S, some true, propos uh, some true sentence, because he's all thinking of this in very linguistic terms, some true sentence S uh, allowable into the set of relevant conditions. Well, we can say whether it entails or is entailed by A, whether it is entailed or entailed by C, whether it's uh, entailed by some disjunction or construction out of these things or whatever, but we can't appeal to anything else. In particular, Goodman was very clear that it was not legitimate to appeal to syntactic properties, um, such as whether, some, whether a sentence is disjunctive, for example, whether a condition is, uh, a sentence stating a condition is disjunctive. That's a syntactic property of a sentence. But uh, Goodman emphasized, and this is part of the whole Grublin story, um, that, um, that um, syntactic properties were, formulate, were ways of characterizing a certain particular way of expressing some, um, some um, I mean, we would say from proposition, but Goodman didn't believe in propositions, but some, um, you, you want to explain things in terms of the extension, um, uh, because again, you want to talk about meaning, but you want to explain things in terms of the extension of um, the predicates uh, that were relevant, the conditions that were relevant conditions. Um, so if you could formulate, uh, a you could formulate a disjunctive sentence 
in a different way by having a primitive one that meant what the disjunction meant. And uh, so that would be the same, um, uh, the same condition, really. So uh, he ruled out the legitimacy, as did other people giving analyses of explanation and other notions in this time, ruled out the legitimacy of syntactic um, properties. Um, okay, so uh, what's left? And Goodman tried various things. He said, well, you've got to insist that the condition can't be entailed by the consequent or by the falsity of the consequent or, or uh, by itself it can't entail the consequent. Together with the antecedent it can entail the consequent. That's what we want. But uh, it can't entail the consequent uh, all by itself, you might say, or it can't entail the negation of the consequent uh, by itself. Uh, and it can't entail the antecedent, or maybe it can't entail the negation of the antecedent, and so on. Um, so you, you, and he tried out various combinations, and he also considered the possibility that maybe you should put a negative condition in. So you've got to find a set of relevant conditions that satisfy some properties, but there's no set of relevant condition that yields the opposite conclusion. So you might have a condition that enforces that you're never going to get if A then C and also if A then not C. Um, so he tried on various things and eventually said nothing's going to work. And his sort of rhetorical device for giving up at the end, it isn't that he, ref he proved that nothing could work of the kind that met his conditions, but he simply said, well, what we really need is a condition which he called cotenability. Uh, so what is cotenability? That is, a condition has to be cotenable with the antecedent, which means it's a fact, it's something true, but it's not that it would be false if the antecedent were true. So um, uh, one of the reasons you can't include uh, the match um, uh, what didn't light among the relevant conditions is that that's something that wouldn't be false anymore if the match were struck. But Goodman says, but cotenability is explained in terms of counterfactuals. So our analysis would be circular if we, uh, if we allowed uh, an appeal to cotenability in giving, uh, in giving the um, the analysis. Um, okay, so as I mentioned last time, um, rather than giving up uh, and taking it to be a sign of failure that the most natural explanation of the line between relevant conditions and um, and things that were not relevant or not allowed or not admissible in this set. Rather than uh, give up when the analysis became circular, he might have thought, well, let's take our theory not as a reduction, but as a pair of axioms, uh, which don't uniquely determine uh, a value, but do constrain uh, the interpretation. So, um, we have the proposed analysis, which was that uh, if if A then C is true, if and only if uh, A conjoined with gamma sub A and tail C. Okay, and then you say, so our problem is what's gamma A? And we give our circular account of gamma A by saying um, uh, S um, is a member of gamma A. Any given sentence is a member if and only if it's not the case that if A
if A then not S. And you say, given this definition, this is not a reductive analysis. But still, if you say, here are two postulates governing the counterfactual. Um, and uh, one can ask, what are the properties that this pair of uh, axioms enforces on the counterfactual? And you can say quite a lot on this, on this basis. In particular, um, one can say um, that the counterfactual obeys certain logical principles, such as if A then B, and if A then C, then if A then the conjunction of B and C, and so forth. So, um, so this would have been a start on a different project, but Goodman was interested only in a reductive um, analysis. Now, when we get to Lewis, Lewis was interested in getting clear about the logical structure of the counterfactual, and that played a role in setting up the problem which corresponded to Goodman's problem of explaining, um, uh, explaining uh, relevant uh, conditions. So once you set it up and give a formal semantics for, uh, for the counterfactual, simply taking for granted in the way in which um, Goodman was not willing to, taking for granted problematic notions and saying we take them for granted and then we have the project of explaining them. But we've sharpened or clarified or changed in a way the problem of uh, explaining from a sort of more linguistic uh, problem of specifying a set of sentences to a problem of characterizing a sort of overall parameter of the relation in, uh, of, of the semantics, in, uh, which in Lewis's term was a comparative similarity relation. Okay, so that's, uh, that's Goodman's project. And I, as I said in one of the papers that you, some of you read, um, just as a sort of interesting um, sociological note, Goodman was one of, um, was one of uh, David Lewis's teachers uh, at Harvard, uh, and so was Quine. And Lewis uh, took it upon himself as his uh, early work to try to refute his teachers. So in particular, his teachers were arguing for negative conclusions. Uh, in particular with Quine, there's no such thing as truth by convention uh, and this general rejection of the analytic synthetic distinction. Um, and Lewis's first project was an analysis of convention, an analysis which uh, did not have the properties that Quine was uh, worried about and which did, Lewis argued, permit uh, a coherent notion of truth by convention. Uh, um, uh, and the, the Lewis's work is very important on convention. It led to that to a, a range of further, uh, further work and application, both within philosophy and, and, uh, and in computer science and other places. Goodman, uh, Lewis's second project was uh, the analysis of counterfactuals, arguing that Goodman was wrong. You can give a reductive analysis of counterfactuals, not in Goodman's framework, but in a radically different framework, one that Goodman, just as Quine, rejected the kind of whole possible world's way of thinking that, um, that Lewis used, uh, so uh, all the more so would have, would have Goodman. Okay, so we'll come back to Lewis's version of this, very different version of this project. But first I want to say, as I said, some general things about metaphysical um, reduction. And in particular, by looking at a number of different cases of this kind of uh, reduction. So as I say here, viewed in the handout sort of section two, viewed abstractly, a project of metaphysical reduction is the defense of a thesis that says that a complete description of the world can be given in terms of the resource, in terms of resources of some specified kind. So, for example, to get some more traditional empiricist reductive projects, the original Carnapian and other early logical positivist um, project was an attempt, took the observation language 
um, to which all of science should be reduced, to be a phenomenalist language, a language where the basic concepts were phenomenal concepts, concepts of phenomenal experience. Um, so color concepts, for example, um, where by color you mean a property of an experience. Um, different ways of spelling out what a phenomenal object is, sense data, um, uh, different ways of saying what sense data are, but the original idea was to try to reduce um, um, uh, objective language to phenomenalist language. One of Goodman's teachers, C. I., another Lewis, C.I. Lewis, um, was a phenomenalist, and Goodman took after him on this, in this regard, and some of the problems about counterfactuals first come up in the attempt to explain uh, physical object properties in terms of phenomenal properties. So um, C.I. Lewis talked about a whole infinite range of um, counterfactual judgments of the form, if you did this, you would have an experience of this. If you did that, you would have an experience of that. So to explain what it means for, say, a piece of paper to be white would be partly to explain um, if, you, if you did certain things with the piece of paper or um, observed, looked at it in certain ways, or something, then you would have experiences of this kind and that. Um, so uh, enormously implausible, everyone thinks later, but uh, th that there's any hope. It's a, such a tremendously ambitious idea to try to take. The world itself just consists of phenomenal experience, and our whole theory of uh, an objective world comes from counterfactual thoughts about, um, about how our experience would change as we move. Uh, around in, in, uh, in the world. Um, so um, the problem of counterfactuals as it sort of becomes particularly salient to Goodman partly through his phenomenalist, um, um, uh, the, the project of using counterfactuals in an application of a phenomenalist theory. And of course, along with fact, fiction, and forecast, Goodman's most famous work, The Structure of Appearance, is a, an attempt to do the kind of thing that Carnap did in um, the, log the Aufbau, the logical structure of the world, um, and do it with, with more sophisticated logical resources. Uh, but it, it was like Carnap's early project, a phenomenalist uh, uh, project. So uh, phenomenalism is a particularly severe and implausible or an ambitious uh, version of a, of a metaphysical um, reduction. Um, uh, more generally, when the positivists became more moved from a phenomenalist language to what they called a physical thing language, uh, there's a thought that we have an observation language, which is a language for describing the objective world, but describing the objective world in terms of observable properties of thing, of observable things in the world. Uh, so that's your base. You say all the world in a sort of early, most uh, um, hardline, um, but not phenomenalist, the sort of next step down was was to think that the, the, what there is in the world to talk about is just, um, is just uh, what can be stated in the observation language. And to the extent we can make sense of higher order theory, which involves unobservable properties and unobservable objects, uh, that has to be reduced to the observation language. Later on, one gets different views about the relationship, more loose views about the relationship between these different, uh, different languages. But at least um, uh, it is an example of a reductionist project um, uh, in the positivist tradition. Now, moving outside of the positivist tradition to more, to later, um, more overtly metaphysical uh, theses, 
um, materialism or physicalism is a, uh, a project of metaphysical reduction. It says that um, physics is the fundamental theory of the world and everything uh, there is in the world can be explained or described in terms of physics. Uh, to the extent that we have concepts that seem problematic from the point of view of physics, they can be reduced um, uh, to physics. They can be explained uh, as supervenient on physical properties. In particular, the whole sort of materialist tradition in the philosophy of mind is a tradition of trying to uh, not perhaps, I mean, the most ambitious idea would try to define mental concepts in terms of physical concepts or functional concepts, which are realized in physical ways. Um, so functionalism and physicalism are versions of a kind of reductive, uh, metaphysical reduction strategy. A different kind of theory, but one that fits the same general pattern is a strategy of uh, addressing the, the uh, uh, problems of personal identity. So one can say that all facts about the relationships between continuate objects over time uh, is re reducible to or explainable in terms of the instantaneous properties of things at particular times. Um, so someone like Derek Parfit, but also some other people who actually want to talk literally about identity, would say that we can give criteria of identity for continuant persons and also for continuant physical objects, what it is to be the same thing. But what it is to be the same thing is reducible to, um, to in some sense, or supervenient on, the instantaneous properties of individual things. Kripke, in unpublished work, has lectures explicitly addressing the very abstract issue of um, reduction to instantaneous states, arguing against this kind of reductive um, project. Um, now, you could be a kind of reduction. I mean, reduction suggests you're actually going to try to define uh, or explain terms that prima facie are not part of your supervenient space. But one could be an eliminativist about, um, about the problematic notions uh, in any one of these uh, projects. So one could be a kind of idealist who says there just is no objective world. And we'll see there's some, some things Ayer says, that A.J. Ayer says, that suggests he is that kind of uh, eliminativist, but they're uh, familiar elim eliminativists about the mind, that is uh, people like Churchland and uh, early stage Rorty, uh, arguing that um, the mental, the theory of the mind and the soul and so on is all a false theory, a false ideology, a false metaphysics, um, and that we should just stop talking about thoughts and uh, feelings and talk more directly about brain states, um, which are all there really is in this, in this realm. So one version of a kind of reductionist is an eliminativist. Um, another uh, is uh, more uh, ecumenical, trying to explain how talk of the mind or talk of identity over time or talk of the real uh, uh, scientific um, entities and so on is all legitimate, but legitimate because it's reducible. Uh, or one can give definitions or at least uh, explanations of, of what we're doing when we talk about these other things. Quine, in, who is definitely a eliminativist about meaning and about certain uh, mentalistic uh, intentional notions, um, sort of men, made the point that in some ways he's like um, an anti-reductionist. So he, he said Brentano uh, took, argued that intentional notions, mental intentional notions are uh, irreducible. They're for the further level of reality. 
uh, because they're not reducible to the physical and argued that they're not. And, and Quine said, well, he agrees with this. They aren't reducible, and therefore they should be eliminated. Uh, so the same metaphysical view as the, um, as, as the, uh, uh, as the materialist reductionist, but a different idea of what to do with the apparently uh, problematic notions. Okay, so um, one example of, uh, or perhaps more than one example, of this kind of uh, metaphysical reductive project is to take the, um, the notions of natural necessity, uh, a whole family of concepts including objective chance, um, causal dependence and independence, um, um, uh, causation itself, and so on. All of this family of notions um, should be, including the sort of natural necessity itself, should be um, explained, need to be explained in terms of a base. But um, the main thing I want to make, sort of general point I want to make about um, about the character of a metaphysical reduction is that often the focus is on whether you can succeed, that is, whether a certain explanation of mental concepts in terms of physical concepts or um, um, concepts of continuate objects in terms of instantaneous properties whether these explanations work or whether we have to say the problematic notions are really something over and above um, the base. But those debates presuppose that we have identified a clear distinction between the base and the other stuff. So in terms of sort of language of talking about supervenience, one often talks about the reduction of properties in the A set to properties in the B set. And the problem is to characterize the B set, the set of the supervenience base, um, and to say everything is reducible or explainable or supervenient on that. But often, uh, while that's taken for granted, often the real problem with a reduction or, or um, a, a metaphysical reductive uh, project is that no base has been made clear. Um, that is, um, that is, uh, I mean, on one hand, you have to motivate taking the base to be something problematic, unproblematic, but, um, but one also has to explain what it is. And while I think a materialist might be on fairly solid ground here, as a materialist might reasonably say, uh, we have a theory, physics, um, which is an articulation of a certain kind of property. We say, well, we don't know, we've got the complete physics, so maybe, as Lewis mentions in talking about um, reduction, maybe the basic or fundamental properties of nature will include some we don't know about yet. But nevertheless, we have sort of a pretty clear idea of what counts as a physical property, and we know intentionality, meaning, aboutness, these kinds of things aren't or experiential properties like um, feeling painful or something like that, these are not um, something that physics talks about or will talk about even in a fundamental um, physics. If the fundamental theory of nature winds up talking about aboutness or um, uh, painfulness, um, then that will show materialism is false. So we have some pretty clear idea what the base uh, is in that case. For many other uh, reductive projects, it's much less clear that what they have identified a base. Many people argue against, say, the kind of reduction to, um, to, um, to instantaneous properties by arguing that the very concept of an instantaneous property is not intelligible, uh, except uh, in terms of its relationship to properties that exist across time. And one of the ways to make this point is to focus on a notion like instantaneous velocity. So does it make sense to think of instantaneous velocity 
as a property of an instant that's separable from the surrounding, what's going on in the surrounding times. So could you take a, a time slice where something is moving with an instantaneous velocity um, of 100 uh, kilometers an hour and embed it in a different place where um, it's also at the very same place before that and after it. Um, so the instantaneous um, velocity is not in, um, identifiable in that other context, but it's still sort of there underneath. Or say, no, that doesn't make any sense. So instantaneous velocity is not really an instantaneous property. So one say, well, there are real instantaneous properties and everything is supervenient on them, uh, including uh, only apparently ones which are abstractions from uh, continuous uh, properties. But that uh, is part of a project uh, not only of defending um, um, the reduction to a base once you've got the base, but of saying what the base is. So I want to suggest that uh, the central problem with Lewis's um, um, project of metaphysical reduction of the natural necessity concepts to, the, um, to a base is that the base itself has not been, uh, has not been coherently um, identified. Um, okay, so let's look more specifically then at Lewis's uh, project of reduction. And we have some, I mean, one of the things they say, I, I think, um, well, I don't think Lewis's project works. Part of the work of showing that it doesn't work is helped by the, ex uh, by the extreme explicitness and clarity of Lewis's characterization of his project. So I think um, uh, while I think uh, the project doesn't work, it is spelled out in a way um, that, um, uh, that helps us to see uh, what's wrong with it. Um, okay, so I'll start with two, uh, on the handout, two quotations which are attempts to characterize the base. And again, that's our main focus here is what is the base, what is the supervening in space? What are we trying to reduce concepts of natural necessity to? And this is a helpful thing for trying to distinguish what are, what's distinctive about natural necessity as contrasted with something else. Okay, so I'll read, I'll read uh, both of these, but, um, and this is from an introduction to his uh, philosophical, uh, second collection of philosophical papers, which is mainly about the issues concerning natural necessity, the, all the papers in that collection. Humean supervenience is named in honor of, its of the great denier of necessary connections. It is the doctrine that all there is in the world is a vast mosaic of local matters of particular fact, just one little thing after another. We have a geometry that is uh, in our characterization of the world. So again, this is sort of a general theory. What is a characterization of the fundamental nature of reality? What, what, what is, form does it take? And he's very explicit about this. We have a, a geometry that is a system of external relations of spatio-temporal distance between points. Okay, now, this is a relational structure. Um, and that's one of the things that's given in the characterization of reality. And then he says, again, this is put in a tentative way, but it's, it's defining the thesis that he wants to defend. Maybe the points of space-time itself um, um, uh, and uh, maybe point size bits of matter or ether or field, maybe both, uh, are also things in the world. So in the world we have a space-time structure and we have space-time points in that structure. We have, um, we have point size, perhaps we have point size bits of matter or perhaps we have point size uh, properties of fields uh, or of the ether. And again, he's, he's trying to be neutral about what the correct physics is going to turn out to be. Maybe we have fields 
Uh, but fields are all identifiable uh, by properties of instantaneous, of, of, of particular momentary points in space-time. Um, and at those points, we have local qualities, perfect, perfectly natural intrinsic properties, which need nothing bigger than a point at which to be instantiated. For short, we have an arrangement of qualities and that's all. That's reality. There is no difference without a difference in the arrangement of qualities. That's the supervenience claim. No difference in, in anything else without a difference of, of this. All else supervenes on that. So that's the sort of rough intuitive characterization of Humean supervenience. And I say, well, I think this is extremely clear in a way, when we start looking at what these point size, what these qualities of point size things are, it becomes much less clear what we're talking about. Um, okay, a second quotation, this one from the plurality of worlds, written us a little bit later. Uh, the world has its laws of nature, its chances and causal relationships, and yet, perhaps, all there is to the world is its point-by-point -point distribution of local qualitative character. We have a spatio-temporal arrangement of points at each various local, uh, at each uh, various local intrinsic properties may be present, instantiated perhaps by the point itself or perhaps by point-sized bits of matter or fields that are located there. Okay, same just repeating the same basic idea in slightly different words. And then, but going on, there may be properties of mass, charge, quark, color, and flavor, um, field strength, and so on, and the like. And um, there may be others beside, uh, if physics as we know it is inadequate to its descriptive task. Is that all? Are there laws? chances and causal relationships, uh, that is, or are laws, chances, and causal relationships nothing but patterns uh, of which, which supervene on this point-by-point -point distribution of properties? Question mark, but that's the thesis. Um, okay, so again, the main thing I want to do is contrast this conception of the base with what the empiricist uh, was thinking, which, which is what motivated Hume in, um, in finding natural necessity problematic. So again, quoting Hume, upon the whole, there appears not throughout all of nature, any one instance of connection which is conceivable to us. All events entirely loose and separate. One event follows another, but we never can observe any tie between them. They seem conjoined in, t in space and time, but never connected. Okay, that's from the Inquiry is again characterizing the way Hume's thinking of his motivation for this denial of necessary connection. It's because it's unobservable. Though there is no, and again, a specific uh, remark about the notion of chance, which is one of the notions in the family of natural necessity concepts. Um, though there is no such thing as chance in the world, our ignorance of the real cause of any event has the same influence on the understanding and begets like species of belief or like it begets like species, a like species of beliefs and opinion or opinion, again from the inquiry. And then one of the peculiar features of that particular quotation is um, while he's denying chance, he's appealing to cause. Um, one of the causes um, of our, um, uh, and then we talk about influence, 
and the event has the same influence on the understanding as a chance event would. So we have a kind of, as people have remarked and criticized Hume for his inconsistency in having a causal explanation for the fact that there is no such thing as causal connection. Um, okay, now following in the same empiricist tradition with the same kind of motivation, uh, we have uh, a, a, again a whole page of quotations from a ra rather unfamiliar paper of A.J. Eyre about conditionals, in particular about counterfactuals. Um, and one of the things Eyre makes clear is this is kind of the phenomenalist character, as in Hume, all what's problematic about necessary connection, it's not an idea that can be explained in terms of impressions, sense impressions, phenomenal properties of experience. Uh, and air has the same kind of uh, view. I propose to look upon the world as uh, consisting of a bedrock of fact, and the only statements which I shall regard as being strictly factual will be those that are limited in their content to supplying true and false descriptions of this world, together with such statements as are obtainable from them by quantification of the use of extensional operators. All other empirical statements, or at least all those that function at a higher level, will be construed as relating to the arrangement or the explanation of what is to be um, in the, prim the primary facts. So again, trying to characterize the supervenience base as a level of bedrock fact, one little thing after another, as Lewis put it. But uh, he emphasizes that he said, I wanna, I'm making a distinction which ordinary language blurs. Thus, familiar objects, he's recognizing that our familiar common sense way of talking about um, the bedrock of fact, factual things in the world, even at the observation level, um, uh, involve uh, concepts that are causally loaded. Something that many people have emphasized in criticizing uh, uh, Hume. So my examples are meant to be identified by their phenomenal properties. My reference to them is not to be understood as carrying any logical implication about their powers. And Lewis must say the same thing about his properties. Powers are, or capacities or dispositions are features of the world um, that uh, are part of the problematic character that need to be reduced to the more basic um, level. At one point here, considers the question uh, a little puzzle about what we should say about a counterfactual flip of the coin. So this is the case, you know, if we had a, a clear counterfactual, how would the coin have landed if it had been flipped? It's a fair coin. How would it have landed? Uh, he concludes that the statement, if I had flipped that coin, it would have landed heads, is not meaningless, we can make sense of it, but it does not have a truth, it lacks a truth value. But then he raises a puzzle about this. He said, uh, we're, we're, in our ordinary talk, we allow the principle of excluded middle, allow for truth values, applied to statements that are, um, that there are flowers growing in some unexplored cranny of a mountain, not unexplored, but never to be explored, shoals of fish swimming in a sea, even though their presence goes forever undetected. In these cases, we can indeed claim that the statements are testable in principle, but still they're not phenomenal statements. But they're tested in terms of phenomenal statements. But the phenomenal statements that test them are themselves counterfactual. A suitably equipped observer might have occupied the required spatial temporal position but then he says, but then, of course, I might have tossed the coin. So you can think of the possible toss of a coin as an empirical test. So um, uh, can we say that if we had tossed the coin, it would have landed heads or it would have landed tails? And that's a test uh, of what, how uh, uh, the truth value for that 
um, that uh, kind of factor. What's the difference? And he tries to explain the difference, but not in a very, um, very not in a, uh, obviously satisfactory way. Just some sort of general remarks that uh, that he makes. It's only at some level of theory that we can form any picture of an objective world. Okay, so the theory about the objective world is not part of the base in the way he's thinking of it. And, he, and again, a, a final remark, which is most striking uh, example showing, of a remark showing that Air is kind of an expressivist, an anti-realist about the objective world. Right? The upshot of this discussion is that, in a certain sense, causes are what we choose them to be. We do not decide what facts habitually go together, but we do decide what combinations are to be imaginatively projected. The despised, to say something on politically incorrect, um, uh, the despised savages who beat gongs at solar eclipses to summon back the sun are not making a factual mistake. They see what is going on as well as we do, if you're talking about the objective reality. It's just that they have a different and we think, we, we have a different and we think better idea of the way the world works. But the very idea that this better idea about the way the world works is not something that's true or false, but rather just a matter of imposing uh, um, our imaginative ideas on the objective uh, world. So if you follow the true Humean motivation into the modern time, as Ayer does, you get an extremely implausible view of what the supervenience base is. It's a phenomenalist uh, base. But Lewis does not follow this, um, um, uh, this uh, idea. Um, um, rather, um, as, as we saw in the characterization um, of, of Lewis's notion of Humean supervenience, the properties that we can take to be part of the base are uh, the properties of point-sized bits of matter or fields or things located uh, in fields or in space. And he said these are properties like mass, charge, quark, color, and flavor. Uh, color and flavor, field strength, and so on. Just the properties that Air said were not part of the base because they're causally loaded. But for Lewis, these properties, these fundamental properties of physics, are not causally loaded. So Lewis' metaphysical theory explicitly separates the property itself from the laws of nature that uh, state, uh, contingent laws of nature, which state the relationships between. Uh, properties and, and the way in which properties evolve over, over time, the way in which the world evolves over time. So um, one might think that it's intrinsic to the very idea, say, of electrical charge that negative charged particles repel each other. But that's a law that that happens and it's a wholly contingent law. So Lewis would say in another possible world, um, um, particles which are negatively charged attract one another. Uh, or maybe they just are neutral with each other or whatever. So the difference between positive charge and negative charge, between mass and energy and all these different things, all these are contingent properties of intrinsic properties which have no causal structure to them or no causal uh, properties. So the very idea that there are such properties uh, is itself um, a highly problematic um, notion. So my general view is that, that we have a coherent Humean project, um, but one that's extremely implausible because it's, it's a, I mean, you can understand how phenomenal properties that are just the 
mere experience of a red color or of warmth or something like that has no intrinsic causal properties. It's just there and identifiable in itself. Uh, I don't think that's a, um, itself a, a plausible idea, but, but it's at least one can understand why uh, one's leaching out the causal properties when one goes from physical object uh, th uh, properties to uh, phenomenal properties. But the idea that one can do the same thing with the fundamental properties of nature, and so there's nothing, uh, nothing empirical, nothing to do with how we know about these things, that is our reason for taking them to be unproblematic. So why should we take these, um, these pure, um, um, pure intrinsic properties with no, which are part of the nature but have no causal powers that are intrinsic to them, how should we take the, why should we take these to be uh, un, uh, unproblematic? Okay, well I'm um, running out of time again too, uh, too early, but um, let me just say a little bit about the order of explanation in Lewis's, um, uh, in Lewis's project. So um, first thing we have to do, and this is what, what Goodman would have said uh, too, but he didn't really have a, uh, much of a theory of, of this, um, we need to explain laws of nature. That's the thing that comes first. Again, we're worried here about avoiding circularity. So we're going to say, we're going to appeal to laws of nature, which is a problematic notion, but first we're going to explain them. Independently of causation, independently of uh, counterfactual dependence, and so on. So laws of nature are to be thought of as simply patterns, uh, global patterns, uh, exhibited by the world as a whole. So he has a, what he calls a best systems analysis of laws. Again, there's a lot of um, the details aren't worked out by Lewis of these things, but a very clear idea of, of the order of explanation. So there's plenty of problems with explaining what, um, what the best system of laws is but it's all to be supervenient on the pattern of distribution of particular uh, facts. And so one must sort of have an economical um, um, formulation of the basic principles that govern the patterns, and that's the, those are laws of nature. Second in order is, um, is the explanation of comparative similarity in terms of laws plus uh, plus uh, distribution of particular facts in time. Um, so counterfactuals come up pretty early in this stage of a, a general reduction of counterfactuals to laws of nature plus particular facts. Um, uh, then third, in terms of counterfactuals, we can define a notion of counterfactual dependence and independence. Um, and again, it's fairly straightforward. This step worked out in, in clear enough detail. Fourth, causation is to be explained in terms of counterfactual dependence. It's not to be identified with causal dependence because there are all kinds of problems with the de of detail in explaining causation, which he addresses in, over a whole series of, of papers. But um, as Lewis emphasizes, each step um, in the process uh, has its own set of problems, and this is only a general strategy and not a finished reductive project, but it's clear what the counts as success in this project, so long as one's clear about what the base uh, is. Um, okay, then we'll talk more when we look to the alternatives to reduction at the, uh, at the specific priorities uh, that he yeah, but you can look at that and see um, um, to see exactly how he's going to try to explain uh, what, comparative, what the relevant comparative similarity relation is. He emphasizes that the ordinary impressionistic notion of similarity between possible worlds is not the relevant notion. 
Okay, so finally, just a remark about the supervening in space. Um, again, I've just said this, but uh, for Hume and for air, the Humean reduction is a phenomenalist one. Impressions are the source of all ideas. For Lewis, the base consists of the fundamental properties as identified by physics. But the question is, is it plausible to think of these properties as separable from their causal powers? Lewis is quite explicit that on his metaphysical picture, the fundamental properties are only contingently connected to their dispositional features um, and to the laws of nature. Um, okay, uh, if one judges, as I do, based on this sort of schizophrenic motivation, really, for, for, the, uh, for, for the attempt to find a reductive analysis, that the inductive project is misconceived, what's the alternative? What kind of explanation, short of reduction, should we give of the priorities uh, that govern the selection of the relevant possibilities for the interpretation of counterfactual conditional? So I want to agree with Lewis that what we need is some kind of explanation for the nature of this so-called similarity relation. But we don't have a reductive explanation, but we also don't want to say, oh, it's primitive, just, just take it, right? use it. Uh, we want to say something about what function it's playing, and that will help us see how we make it. And the explanation that I want to give does tie closely the criteria of similarity to the epistemic uh, uh, uses of, uh, of counterfactuals, which connect with the epistemic uses of indicative um, conditional. So we'll look back again a little bit at the indicative case and, and see how, uh, what role that plays in trying to characterize um, um, uh, the respect of similarity which we use to interpret counterfactuals. Okay, thanks. There is time for questions. Maybe as I start, okay. and then we leave time to the other to think to their question. Um, listening to you today, it comes to me clear that the problem of the similarity among possible words, which is relevant for your account and for uh, Lewis' account of, counter, of conditionals in general, and in, for Lewis just for the count, uh, counterfactual and for you for all the conditional, uh, requires a base for the similarity to be uh, and uh, if the base is just constituted by local properties or local, uh, local properties, as Lewis seems to say, uh, as you say, there may be possible words, different possible words, which has the same local basis and different causal powers. Right, right, that's, yeah. uh, uh, that's the idea. Uh, so, I try to make a question like that. Uh, do you believe that these powers some, is something which is, should be intrinsic to the characteristic mm -hmm. of the words? Yes, that's, um, I mean it is, characteristic of the Humean strategy, both Lewis's form and the more traditional form, that causation, while, I mean, sometimes Hume suggests it really doesn't exist at all, mm -hmm. but he also suggests it's extremely important mm -hmm. in epistemology. Mm -hmm. And so one way of interpreting Hume is as giving a reductive account, but what's 
clear is that the reductive account is global, not local. So as you say, you could have a possible world uh, which was locally, uh, even in a fairly wide range around the local situation, locally exactly like our world, um, but the causal features of what's going on in that local area are totally different. So, um, so and Lewis, Lewis's development of the project makes clear the way in which um, uh, the local um, causal properties are, um, are dependent on the entire pattern of the history of, of the world. Mm -hmm. So that's a feature of the reductive project in the Humean spirit. But it's not a feature of, um, of anyone who wants to talk about uh, counterfactuals as having a semantics in terms of some kind of uh, relation of comparative similarity. So the, what contrasts the, re, the um, reductive uh, project with the non-reductive project is um, it's not that we start with um, um, a more austere description of the possible worlds and then in terms of the, those more austere characterization of the possible worlds, find relations of similarity and difference, and then, um, uh, and then gets the extra properties out of that. Um, um, so, uh, there's no attempt to avoid circularity in the general uh, uh, theory in the sense that one can say among the fundamental local properties of things are, um, are um, uh, causal powers. Mm -hmm. And uh, if um, those weren't there, things locally would be Different. So the very idea of local versus global is, um, is itself um, problematic unless one has identified um, some base. Mm -hmm. There's a similar kind of thing in, in modal um, uh, and ways of thinking about modal metaphysical, mo metaphysical modality. Um, some people talk as if, and some people's metaphysical view assumes that there are categorical, non-modal, there's a sort of non-modal way of characterizing a world, and that the modal properties are properties of certain sets of worlds, um, uh, but uh, not properties uh, of, of the individual. But you sort of look at the way, um, it's one of the features of the formal semantics is it doesn't make that assumption, that it doesn't assume that, I mean, there's not a kind of hierarchical explanation of modality. It's rather um, we have a set of possible worlds characterized however you characterize uh, worlds, and then, um, and then um, the, uh, the modality arises from, uh, from, uh, from the set. Um, but that um, essential properties of things, for example, are intrinsic properties of individual things um, in the actual world or in other possible worlds. And they give rise to uh, modal features uh, because one can connect them with um, uh, with relationships between other things. But it's not that you start with a theory that says, well, here's this local thing, and here are these other local things in other possible worlds, and then we add to that some 
counterpart ties between them. That's one kind of metaphysical theory, but that's not the basic um, theory. So you can say the things in different possible worlds are already identified. Uh, they already have, and they're identified in virtue of their modal properties. Uh, so there's no assumption that modal and non-modal properties are, uh, have a different sort of hierarchical status of some kind. Now, it's just, just to connect up a little bit with the notion of, of similarity here. One of the reasons, I mean, I never talked about it when I first developed this kind of theory to talk about similarity. I talked about a selection function. And you say, well, the selection function had certain properties in virtue of which uh, it creates an ordering. So the properties, uh, this very little substantive is said about what the orderings are, but the, the selection function uh, imposes an order uh, relative to each possible world of the possible worlds. Uh, similarity, I mean, one of the reasons a human, when I, if you ask a human, a human to ask about relations, similarity relations are reducible to intrinsic properties. Similarity with respect to color means the sharing of intrinsic monadic properties of being, having a color. So in a certain sense, similarity is a kind of relation that reduces to monadic or non-relational properties. Um, um, there are logical relations, but in relations between things in the world, um, to the extent they can be explained in terms of spatio-temporal uh, property, then they're reduced to the relational structure of a space-time space framework. And the other relations are relations of similarity. Uh, causal relations are, pro this is a more abstract way of thinking about the Humean motivation, but the um, abstract, uh, on the abstract level, relations of uh, dependence and connection look like irreducible relations on the face of it, in prima facie, um, uh, look like, um, look like uh, irreducible relations. So you can say if the project is to reduce them to relations of similarity, that is a kind of uh, elimination of something uh, problematic. But um, the kinds of similarity um, and to the extent to which one can apply similarity to the way I want to think of the selection, it's not, it's not something uh, explainable in terms of monadic uh, properties. Mm -hmm. So the selection function is not determined by monadic property, is it? Or, right, uh, right. Uh, in, some, in terms of some, right, yeah. yeah. Some relations, uh -huh. yeah, relational yeah. properties, so, mm -hmm. right. Good. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is just a follow-up on Elisa's questions, because I'm not sure I understand where your worry is with Lewis project and the problem with causal powers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I understand that if we think that fundamental properties are detachable, separable from their causal powers, then something very counterintuitive happens. Uh -huh. it's, it's very odd, yeah. a universe in which negatively charged particles attract each other. It's very odd. Mm -hmm. Lewis will say, sure, it's very odd. Laws of nature are different there, and this is why they look very odd to us. Mm -hmm. But what you have to show us, and I didn't see the argument, I mean, said you haven't, I just didn't see it, okay, <laughs> is uh, uh, what, what exactly is the metaphysical impossibility? I mean, it doesn't seem to be conceptually impossible, mm -hmm. because it doesn't seem to be a priori true that are negatively charged particles should attract each other, maybe it is, but not sure. Right, yeah. Doesn't seem to be metaphysically impossible because it's odd, because I can conceive of it, and looks very strange to me, so I can conceive it. If conceivability is a guide to possibility, therefore it's metaphysically possible. So mm -hmm. maybe the argument, and maybe it's that, is that you think that when we individuate properties, we have to individuate them in terms of their powers, so powers have to play a role in identity of properties. Right. And therefore, if you switch causal powers, properties are not the same anymore. And of course, Lewis will say, no, I don't believe that story. So my question is just, can you say a little bit more about what is the positive argument to think that Lewis is in a yeah, very bad predicament? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So first of all, I should say there is not, not any attempt to suggest that Lewis's theory is inconsistent or incoherent. I mean, he's, um, it's, it's just the, um, I mean, the implausibility is the main uh, thing here. But um, so the more substantive argument, I mean, the overall project when one to uh, understand um, the role of the laws and the powers and the other sorts of things. What is the, what, what is the role of adding these things to our theory of the world and, and giving an explanation or reduction of them? Why do we need them, whether we reduce them or not? Um, and I think, uh, I want to argue that the epistemological role is uh, important and that one can give some kind of explanation of the epistemological role of the powers in, the, in, the, in their contribution in helping us to identify these, uh, these properties. So for Lewis, for which properties are just sets of things, but certain properties are natural. And the naturalness of a property is a primitive. And it's part of the idea of, the nat of a, uh, a property is natural if it's purely intrinsic. I mean, not, that's not the only feature, it's not, but it's a necessary feature of being. Um, so there, there are, prop there is the, the causal properties are properties uh, on Lewis's view. They're just not natural properties. So when one asks why is something detachable from the causal powers and the laws and the rest of it. Why is that the natural property? Why is the counterfactually loaded property not the natural one? The one that plays the role in the laws, essentially. So a different picture would say, and again, the picture is developed in, in the, uh, the opposite extreme of Lewis's view by people like Sidney Shoemaker, where uh, properties just are causal powers. That's that's what a property, a real property is, as opposed to some artificial, gruified property or something like that. And we need these uh, to explain what's going on in, uh, in epistemology. So uh, in the paper on Hume and Supervenus that uh, I uh, uh, have um, apply the kind of Grublin idea to uh, to Lewis's theory and say, you know, there is a property, or here's a, here's a possible world. Um, uh, quark color, uh, what are the names? Green's one of them, right? Um, uh, the quark color, to use quark colors rather than real colors because they're, the quark ones are much more natural. Uh, there is a, a world in which, um, as terms of their causal powers, um, quark color green um, changes place with quark flavor, I've forgotten the names of them now, but um, um, uh, I don't know what, but with a certain, or change with mass, I mean with anything. Where a, a, two properties, since they have no nature that connects them with, with the laws, which simply change places. And I say, how do we know we're not in a world like that? Where actually they did change places two years ago, right? And, and at a certain time. And nobody would ever know the difference. In that. So, so I say, well, we, we identify these properties. It's not just we fix their reference by their causal powers, because uh, the causal powers might change over, over time. Um, or we don't know, we might be totally wrong about what the laws are because the laws could be totally wrong, uh, and yet nothing would appear differently to anybody. So, so the prospect of trying to explain how Lewisian natural properties play any role at all in our epistemology of explaining how we know that the laws um, are true is very difficult to see how it, how it, how it works. Um, now, at a certain point, there's going to be kind of just clash of brute intuitions about, about this kind of thing. In particular, see, when you look at chance, Lewis says, 
if you, in trying to explain the principle that we adjust our beliefs, uh, our subjective probabilities to beliefs about chance, why should we do that? And I say the best way to explain that is in terms of a constitutive connection between the um, between the property of having a certain chance propensity and the reasonableness of forming certain partial beliefs when one knows about that property. That that itself, that constitutive or uh, definitional connection helps to explain why uh, chance plays the epistemic role that it plays. Lewis takes the opposite view. He thinks, I think I can understand how this happens in virtue of Humean regularities, but I don't see how it helps to call this thing a, a, a property. But I you know we, we can look at, explore that that, uh, that kind of detail. Yeah. 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 Since the I mean the point of of your discussion was comparing the uh, reduction account with the non-reductive account, I was wondering whether. So there is one feature of, of uh, the Lucian uh, reductive account, uh, namely modal realism, uh -huh. that you, you didn't really touch upon on it. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, okay, everybody agreed that that's sort of a, a cost. Yeah. <laughs> Basically nobody would. Uh, but it strikes me that, uh, uh, I mean, if you really go to the, the, the way, then there are, of course, certain other uh, things that you get more or less for free. For instance, uh, Similarity, you know, it's just straightforward similarity, the very same thing that we have uh, uh, in, uh, so similarity, similarity between possible words is just the very same you know, similarity that we have within our word. So if we are happy uh, with having uh, similarity as an intrinsic uh, relations, uh, uh, relation that just depends on the intrinsic property of the relator, we have it uh, uh, also, um, well, I mean, we have that very same, that, that very kind of similarity also uh, between possible words. Yeah, yeah. And that like, seems, you know, uh, of course, it, it comes with the, the cost of the, of the modern realism, yeah, yeah. but uh, this looks like, a, a, you know, a, a big chunk of the, of the whole project already, yeah, uh, yeah, already on board, yeah, yeah, so just... Yeah. Yes, yeah, good. I think, um, I mean, there are, there are you're the right, there are very, um, there's, there's a whole metaphysical picture which has different parts, and to some extent they're separable, um, but um, they interconnect in their motivating of, of the whole project. So I think, I mean, again, one of the ways I would put, in my view about possible worlds, generally, the modal, the relational properties, uh, relations between possible worlds, um, there's not a sort of clear distinction between intrinsic properties of possible worlds and relational properties. Um, if you're, you could say that if you're a modal realist too, but modal realism tends more, I think you're right, to, to, to sort of motivate, um, just as these are just entities and, and ordinary entities have, I mean they're big complicated ones, but have intrinsic properties and relational properties which are distinguishable in, in, in some way. Sort of part of your conception of an object uh, is a conception of the, um, um, uh, the difference between these things. I, I, so um, uh, one might expect to find in a, in a more realist picture more reason to think that there is a good distinction between these, these things to be made. But, uh, and that's again, a part of the, I mean, I appeal to the sort of counterpart idea, which is part of the modal realism, um, although it isn't necessarily tied to modal realism. And that uh, helps to uh, for enforce the distinction between, because the counterpart relation is a relational property uh, and an um, one that needs to be reduced to similarity uh, between possible worlds. Um, um, so um, the, the sort of reductive project for counterfactuals is just part of a family of 
um, of reductive projects of, of the kind that they go with this. So I think that's that's right, and that that has to be brought. I mean, again, I think, you know, one doesn't address big metaphysical questions generally by giving knockdown arguments against somebody. But I think what one does in doing uh, metaphysics is tie various issues together uh, and say, well, here's a package. Uh, Hume and Supervenience counterpart theory and you know, modal realism. And, um, and um, to the extent that you find that package attractive, um, then it helps support all the parts of it. Uh, but um, to the extent that there's severe problems uh, with it, then that's a reason to, to think another package is, is, is better. And again, my emphasis, and the one I think Lewis would say, epistemology, that's just a totally different game than metaphysics. Uh, and I think that's just not right. I, mean, I think you, you, you've got to understand uh, our conception of the world as it is in itself, as uh, the way we form a, a theory of the world is by also forming a theory of how we know about the world. And at forming some, um, some um, conceptual resources. Um, and it's the relationship between our epistemological, conceptual relation between our epistemological um, concepts and our metaphysical concepts, which helps explain how our epistemology works. So that's that's part of um, the big picture, part of the answer to Lucas' question too. I mean, uh, is is that's part of the motivation for being unsatisfied with this reductive project of Lewis's. Uh, so when. Um, when I teach uh, students Stolnaker's theory of conditionals, uh -huh. I try to explain to them what the selection function is by saying, well, you apply it to the proposition expressed by the antecedent and to a world, and then it picks out the world that is uh, closest uh, yeah, yeah. To, the, uh, to that world in which the antecedent is true. Now, you seem to distance yourself uh, a bit from from that sort of simplification, because you say I talked about selection function, not about similarity. Uh -huh. um, so the question is, if you could expand on that, and in particular, whether you know the, this kind of um, distance that you take from Lewis's notion of similarity gives you a different perspective on the problem that Kit Fine raised, which sort of motivated those priorities that, um, that you have on the handout. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Good. You know. OK, so I mean, there's nothing terribly deep in the um, distancing from similarity, it's the main, I mean, again, there's a lot of different notes, closeness, similarity, and some metaphor, minimal difference. Um, and some, I'm, some, I mean, they're all really saying, strictly speaking, this identifying the same formal properties, namely um, an ordering from the actual world, which the actual world is uh, the start of it, the closest to itself and all. And then there's a, ra a range out from there. And, and um, uh, the only, the main thing in um, being a little unhappy with the metaphorical associations of similarity is, is it does suggest the reductive project of reducing to intrinsic properties. Whereas I want to think of it as a primitive notion, of which closeness is more like, a, closeness is, of course, a spatial metaphor. Um, and uh, nobody thinks closeness is reducible to the intrinsic properties of the things um, themselves. Um, so um, uh, and the idea of minimal difference, I think, comes closer to capturing the intuition. And um, the idea, don't or the, there's an idea of a gratuitous difference. So here's a possible world 
uh, which um, is different from the actual world in ways that are not relevant to uh, the antecedent. And that connects with, I mean, the notion of relevant conditions. Of rel so the, um, all these sort of associations, um, the main thing is to emphasize in terms of any substantive difference is I want to say I'm not suggesting there's any kind of reduction here. There's, no, there's kind of a notion of similarity with respect to properties identifiable independently of um, uh, by, uh, but by looking at the properties of this world and the properties of that world. And that's, of course, what we look at Lewis's uh, list of, of criteria. There, there are possible worlds which, um, which are, have exact match with the actual world for a long period of time, and others that have an exact match for less uh, amount of time. And that's a clear uh, difference between intrinsic properties of the worlds which don't depend on some kind of, kind of ordering. Um, um, so um, that's really the, uh, the main thing. I want to say, uh, I want to, if one looks at, the, uh, spells out a little bit more, well, exactly what counts as minimal change. And I want to say, well, I mean, this is what I'll try to bring out in the next, next time, but, um, um, don't change anything that's causally independent of the antecedent. You say, what do you mean, causal independence? That's what you're trying to explain, right? And causal dependence is, in one notion, is definable in terms of counterfactuals, as Lewis says. First come the similarity relations, then comes causal dependence and independence, or counterfactual. Uh, I want to say that, that um, uh, if you look at the various different attempts, piecemeal attempts to explain various um, n notions in the family, you keep coming across a notion of independence, much more robust than the notion of causation. So I would say, I agree with, with Lewis that our explanation of causation should come later in our story. Um, but an explanation of causal independence uh, comes earlier in, in the story. And again, it's clearly not um, going to be reduced to something else, but we're going to be able to explain its role in epistemology. And that's, um, and that, so, you know, if you say, um, um, suppose you could, if you think of, um, the metaphor of change, tweak the world to make the antecedent true. Um, what do you, you have no motive at all for changing something that's going on in some other part of the world that has no interaction with this. Leave it the same. But of course, we're using causal notions to say that, and so we're not engaging in a, in a reductive. Uh, project, but I think we'll see whether there's any help at all. I mean, I want to, as I say, I'm not, I mean, Lewis has a much clearer um, project in terms of what counts as success, even though he recognizes there are many parts that remain to be filled in, but uh, I have a much more um, um, much less clearer idea of what counts as progress uh, in these things. As, as, uh, that's part of, the, part of the difference between a reductive project and the alternative, is that uh, the criteria of success, what are you trying to do, when have you made progress on, on your problem, is much more difficult to give a general, uh, general account of. But, um, but it will remain an uh, interactive um, project in the sense that we, we're going to develop a conception of what are the fundamental properties of nature um, together with a theory about what are the relevant similarity or uh, closeness or selection or whatever. What, what are the relevant criteria for that? Are they going to be developed 
uh, in interaction with each other, not first do this, then do that. So that's the idea. Okay, thanks. So um, this is a bit of a, I guess, a more overview question that might not be uh, directly related to the natural necessity stuff, but this has to do with the way that you um, uh, characterize metaphysical reductions. Uh -huh. So if I can just read a sentence from your handout just to see, this is probably just clarificatory. So you say <clears throat> at the beginning of uh, part two on page one, a project of metaphysical reduction is the defense of a thesis that says that a complete description of the world can be given in terms of the resources of some specified kind. And, um, well, my question is this, why does it have to be specified as opposed to specific? Uh, and the difference I'm thinking of here is that you might um, not necessarily at the outset or at the beginning of a, a reductive project have a clear um, understanding of what the reduction base is, yet go ahead with the reduction on some rough understanding of what the reduction base is and hope yeah. that the, um, that the um, reductive project itself, as it goes on, will help clarify not only the thing reduced, but also the thing it's reduced to. Yeah. So then it might be, you might want to have a more open-ended understanding of the reduction base at the start of the project, just to be, you know, plastic and to, to be able to uh, accommodate different outcomes and so on. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering what you, what you thought about that. Good. No, right, that's a good point. And I think um, uh, um, a point about the methodology um, of giving a reduction of this kind. And I think it's, um, I mean, it's hard to get started unless you have some characterization of uh, what's uh, not allowed, at least, in, in the base. Um, but I think it's, it's right that uh, no problem with the idea that you might be somewhat um, vague and hand-wavy about your base at the start with the um, ambition of clarifying it as you, as you go. Uh, and I think in some way, um, even though it's a very long way to go from Hume and A.J. Eyre to Lewis, um, in some ways, um, um, if you look at the positivist project of going from a phenomenalist language to a physical thing language, in some way this was a way of clarifying the base saying, well, we started with this idea of a phenomenal language, but that didn't, that's, didn't seem to be workable. So, and there was long debates, of course, in the positive time. You know, there is a, 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 an argument about what the base should be. But what's important for the end point you reach is after you've, uh, after you're, clearer about your project is that there's a kind of um, circularity that you're committed to avoiding. So in the end, um, um, the base has to be um, um, identified uh, in a way that makes clear that um, uh, that we're not smuggling in um, notions that are problematic. So clarifying the base and clarifying what's not in the base have to go um, together. In the end, it's clear you've got to have a, um, um, uh, a non, the one, they have a, there's an asymmetry in the sense of the base has to be sort of intelligible in itself. Uh, and the other things um, derivative um, from it. Otherwise, I mean, you can only that begins as a reductive project and turns into something else, but um, that, that's what I take to be sort of essential to the whole reductive strategy here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Can I have a quick, quick follow-up? Yeah, so uh, I, I agree with what you said. There is a, 
Another thing that's sort of in the vicinity, which I thought was a bit problematic, is the um, idea that, meso that you characterize metaphysical reductions in terms of descriptions to begin with. Um, so, you know, you could, you know, uh, here's a, a position you could hold. Um, I am, um, for good reasons, completely certain that the mind is reducible to the physical. And I attach a thesis saying that the way in which this uh, connection or whatever it is holds is just epistemically uh, inaccessible. So I can't, I can't have a description of the, the exact um, uh, nature of the connection between the physical and the mind, but I can know by, you know, say, causal experiments or something by pointing at the brain that, oh, that changes your consciousness. You can have reasons for th thinking that all there is is physical without necessarily thinking that that entails the possibility of having complete descriptions of the connections between the derivative and the fundamental or the physical on yeah, mind right. and so on. And, uh, but maybe, I don't know if that's a problem, but that's, that seems to be a metaphysical reduction thesis of a sort that doesn't necessarily entail that there is a description available mm -hmm. to be formulated. Good. Now, I think at a certain point um, in a project that takes a certain direction, the distinction between a reductive project um, um, and its alternative becomes um, harder to, to be clear about. So I think, and, and this comes out in the physicalism literature, I think, and that is exactly what is a physicalist committed to. So you have people certainly like Tyler Burge who sort of very explicitly deny that they are physicalists or materialists. Um, yet um, the project of explaining um, um, intentional notions, no, notions having to do with consciousness and and perception and, and intentionality uh, in terms of the way they're realized in uh, the physical world is a part of part of the project. Uh, is it, um, um, and I think in general, uh, the very notion of supervenience, um, you know, can be pushed and, and can, can be perhaps th more problematic than it first appears exactly what the claim is when one says it. The things are supervening because um, clearly we we identify properties uh, in in virtue of um, all kinds of different things and uh, the idea that we we have picked out a physical property but don't tell me what physical property uh, it's the property we pick out this way and then you use some mental vocabulary or something like that so uh, is a person who's I mean, recognizes that is, is that person um, still a materialist or something like that? And I think, um, I mean, I have mixed intuitions about this kind of thing. I want to think of myself as a materialist in a way, but a very liberal one in terms of the kind of explanations you need you need to give. And I, you know, whether that counts as materialism it varies from different ways of thinking about it. Two separate issues here, because when you said, for instance, that the uh, selection function is not determined by so, so, so. the selection function uh -huh. is not determined by uh, similarities between properties, uh -huh. you're using uh, the notion of similarity in a metaphysical sense, which is the, the meaning of similarity or something like that that uh -huh. you is used. But one thing is to uh, give an account on, of counterfactuals in order to reduce, let's say, causal relation to a Jungian picture. Quite another is to try to explain how speakers speak. So using a notion of similarity that is, uh, a, let's say, a tool in order to explain why certain inferences are good are taken to be good by speakers and so on and so forth. So one thing is philosophy of language, the attempt to make sense of how people convey the information that they convey. And quite another is to 
explain how the ultimate structure of reality um, mm -hmm. is. And maybe the notion of similarity that appears in many of your works uh, is, I mean, more on the philosophy of language side than the metaphysical yeah, side. Yeah. Or, I mean, that's why. So. Good. So, honest, it's right, I think, that um, um, one wants to approach, I mean, there's a huge range of different kinds of problems involved with uh, kind of, and, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm very much um, want to emphasize that um, um, at a certain level of abstraction, um, which sort of sets aside, in a way, these substantive problems about similarity and closeness and, and the rest of it, um, that uh, one can explain um, a lot of the, the, the sort of inferential properties and other, um, uh, other uh, features of um, uh, the semantics of, of, of counterfactuals without getting into those uh, issues. Uh, those that, uh, um, and in some ways, it, it's interesting. I mean, Lewis and I um, have very contrasting views about these metaphysical issues and also contrasting views about the semantic issues. Um, and um, they're not totally independent, but they're quite separable in, in a way. And, that, and I think that you can sort of look at um, sort of semantic questions about inference in defense of, say, the principle of conditional excluded middle or against the principle of excluded middle, or about the relationship between um, uh, modal words like might and must on the one hand and conditionals on the other. Um, and you can say, here's examples that tend to point you in this direction and, and on, that, on, on, this, on this semantic uh, issue. And all that is somewhat independent of the question of, um, uh, of whether some kind of reductive project is, is uh, tenable or not. Now, when I've made the general remarks about closeness again, I, um, and similarity, um, to the extent, I want to repeat, to the extent one's focusing on the structural um, features of which are shared by similarity, closeness, um, minimal difference, and, and things like that, um, um, the, the formal structure of a relation, of a three-part relation, that A is closer to, um, to world A than C is to world A, or something like that. Uh, that's the comparative similarity structure, and, and that's, um, 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 that's definitely the structure I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working with. But um, on the question, I mean, one of the, again, the only sort of resistance to similarity was the suggestion that um, uh, it's a relation which should be explainable in terms of intrinsic properties of the relata. That is, uh, two things are similar or comparatively similar um, relative to a third. Um, only if they share properties, uh, more properties of the right kind, or something like that. Um, and um, um, that suggests that the properties shared can be identified independently of the similarity. But, um, but the non-reductive project is going to deny that. So that's the main, main difference there. But again, I think it's right. That doesn't come in a lot of the questions. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, so you said that uh, uh, you one of the desires of your of your project is also to keep uh, like the epistemic side and the metaphysical side close enough. I mean, not, not to right, yeah. uh, and in particular with respect to the individuation of properties. Uh, so the uh, the kind of role that they play in our laws uh, it also tell us something about the, the the essence of the property, or at least. Uh, uh, 
um, it tell us something about what the property is, I mean, essentially. Um, I, I was wondering, I guess that you want to have this position also, uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess you, you, you take on board also a, a bit of fallibilism, right, about a that. A bit of? Uh, fallibilism? Oh, yeah, right. Fallibilism, yeah. right. So, I mean, I guess that uh, um, it's, it's not that we are now in a position to be very, very sure about our uh, present uh, uh, science. Uh, so, I mean, probably right. we get something right, probably, because, I mean, yeah. but, uh, you know, that's a huge debate you know, about uh, uh, what exactly uh, will be retained by our current science, right? Uh -huh. And so I was wondering whether, uh, whereas on the other hand, the, the Lewis project, you know, is uh, sort of compatible with a uh, very radical fallibilism, you know, to the fact that we don't get anything right, you know, because just, they, we just individuate the property through the, to the uh, role that we play in our best system, and then you know whatever is you know it, it can play a very different role in a possible yeah, another yeah. possible world. So that's like mm -hmm. uh, so at, it looks like the Lewis project doesn't have this. Uh, uh, so wait, uh, I was, so I was wondering whether you in your position, no, uh, given that you so you want to tell you want to to have. Uh, the uh, the laws um, telling us something about the nature of the property, mm -hmm. but not all, if only because uh, we have the problem that we don't know which are the laws, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I, so I was wondering whether you know, unless you s you you end up in a in a sort of like extreme fallibilism as well and saying, well, maybe we are completely wrong uh, and, uh, but then, I mean, that's something that also the, the, the Lucian can do. So I, w I was wondering whether you don't feel the pressure to say something about, uh, you know, which part of the, of the, uh, of our current science uh, is, is better to be trust. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you know, if, if you want to give a role to the epistemology, you know, to, to, to tell something about our metaphysics, then you, I think that you might have this pressure more than someone who is like Lewis who just want to say, oh, no, you know, we just need to, you know, say that mm -hmm. there are those properties, but uh, uh, the nature, their nature is, uh, I mean, the causal role, sorry, the nature is not determined by their causal role, so, uh, Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so okay, good. So, Sorry, maybe um, so clear. Yeah, I mean, of course, fallibilism is different from skepticism. And um, it's, uh, it's at least an argument against a view, uh, I think, if it leads to a kind of skepticism. And it's a positive thing if you have some sort of um, your theory of what the world is like and what our epistemology is like, tentative as it is allows for um, us to have good reason to think that we're getting at uh, things, but also to be open to, um, to radical, uh, radical uh, change, I think. And that, but, I mean, I think it's a good question. I mean, because I agree completely with Lewis and say, well, of course, materialism is not tied to current physics. We can imagine physics changing in ways we don't anticipate. Uh, and still, um, that's the complete theory, the correct theory of the world as it, as it develops. And the more one is open to more and more radical changes, the less clear it is exactly what physicalism is, as Lewis would agree. So, um, um, it could be that science develops in such a way as we bring in phenomenal mentalistic concepts uh, as primitives, and and uh, that's the way science develops. In which case, you think, well, that shows uh, it's it's still that's that's not physics, right? That's something else. Right? But the line is, you know, you can imagine ways in which it. So all the sort of panpsychists and so on are sometimes. So that's a version of physics or something like that. So, yeah. so but uh, on my way of trying to develop things, 
certain assumptions about causal structure are, um, are playing a crucial role. And what with quantum mechanics and various other parts of physics, there's various features of causal structure which may be, turn out to be radically different than we think they are. And one has to be open to that possibility that there's, there's errors in the very way we are connecting our epistemology with our metaphysics. Uh, and, but it's going to be our mix of epistemology and metaphysics which leads us in that direction, if that's the way it, it goes. Now, as for laws, be, I mean, I want to, there's part of the Lewis project is, which is not tightly tied to the reductive part, is the order in here. And, that, and to say laws come first, they're more basic. And I think there's at least, I have some inclination to think, to be skeptical about the prominence given to laws of nature and think that causal concepts are um, prior in some sense to laws and maybe laws are generalizations about causal structure. Um, and maybe we shouldn't think just about the fundamental causal structure but at causal structure at other levels of, of, of theorizing. So, um, I mean, at the very beginning of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell wrote an, an extremely influential article arguing that causation plays no role in physics. Um, and that, I mean, nobody talked about causation through the whole positive time. They talked about laws of nature and gnomic regularities and things like that, but not, not causal structure. But causal structure plays a very important role in our theorizing about and again, we'll talk about action, but uh, as well as about, about epistemology. But uh, it's not clear to me that it's all to be explained in terms of, of law-like connections. But we'll see. I mean, I, I agree that one should be somewhat open about what direction the theory should take. So, so it's more causal structure that individuates the properties rather than laws in general. That's, yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I suspect that. I have another question. Okay. Uh, it is more than a question, just a reflection I, I did while I was listening to your answer, and I want to check whether uh, you will accept what I, I was thinking. Uh, because it seems to me that in, your, in this way in which you uh, confront and and discuss Lewis, it, it emerges what is the basic for you and for Lewis. It seems to me that Lewis starts from this Jungian reduction and so for, uh, for, his, for him is essential what the, those basic properties of nature are. Mm -hmm. uh, and then He's ready to, in a sense, probably he's also ready to uh, pay the price that uh, there are things which can be unknowable to us. Yeah. Uh, as I see your project, that's, that's my way, but I want you to uh, react to it. You seem to be very much concerned. You start from the way we actually interact with the world, and you seem to build uh, an ideal way, an ideal epistemic approach to the world. Namely, what uh, the idea is that both semantics and metaphysics comes from uh, the way a person who doesn't make mistakes for some reason uh, comes to understand and to think about the world and to speak about the world and to know about the world. So in this way, there, in, according to your perspective, as I see it, there cannot be something which is even in principle unknowable mm -hmm. or even in principle unsayable, let's say, mm -hmm. because as I see your starting point is that 
the certain point, as I see it, is that this kind of person who is uh, who just doesn't have any epistemic limit as we have, but it is uh, epistemically without uh, without mistakes. Not I'm not saying omniscient. He mm -hmm. can have local knowledge, but he doesn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's how I I want you to react yeah. to this. See. Yeah, of course, two things. First, um, while I think it's good to start with knowledge, uh, with what people don't make mistakes about, um, we also always have to add that, of course, we could be making mistakes. Uh, so we give an example. Uh, in which we say nobody's making any mistakes and we stipulate that that's what's going on here and um, you could say of course in a realistic situation it could well be uh, there are mistakes. Now as for whether um, I don't I certainly don't want to defend any thesis that everything is knowable or everything uh, every proposition is expressible or something like that but um, if you have an argument that um, if a certain theory were correct, a certain metaphysical theory, then things would be unknowable, which it seems to us aren't unknowable. So um, if you ask, can we identify and uh, have re good reason to believe that certain properties, certain fundamental properties, um, are um, realized in our world. They, they are the properties that uh, govern our world, or something like that. Or um, that is not that we can't. It's not that we couldn't possibly be mistaken about that, but that these kinds of considerations seem to be good reasons for thinking that the world is like this or something like it. Right? So, to the extent that our uh, our common sense beliefs about not just what the world is like, but what our um, what our evidence is telling us about it, turn out to be radically wrong according to a certain metaphysical view. That's an argument against that metaphysical view. So, of course, so it isn't just that Lewis says, or I not Lewis says, but I take it to follow from some of his his views that. Uh, it's, it should be unknowable on his view that um, um, there is a property um, of electrical charge that um, plays the role that it plays in our lives that, that we really can't know that then that would be a problem for that theory not because it might be right that certain fundamental properties are unknowable, but these don't seem to be. So it's both the identification of the fundamental properties as the ones physics talks about, uh, at least assuming the physics is roughly correct, um, it's, it's both that identification plus the characterization of the nature of those properties that seem to me to be in tension with, the, with each other. So that's the, but again, you know, I mean, I, again, with both the fallibility and the general recognition that we could be, our epistemology should not tell us that we're necessarily on the right track. I mean, we could be totally wrong. So. I, 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 Today we have uh, a long discussion, yes. and we thank you for that, and so we uh, continue tomorrow. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>